Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold your money in my hand and see what happens. Fifteen ninety times three. Forty-seven seventy. Oh, I'm ten cents short. Well, I'm just going to have to let you go for that. How's that? Pick your three books. What is there a difference? No. Will you sign them? I will certainly. What would you like them to say? I don't know. Best wishes. Happy days. Best wishes. Happy days. No. Well, do you want them? Choose somebody specifically. Do you want a receipt for these three books? No. For my own records here, seven to the historical. Uh, it's free. Oh, yeah. Three plus tax. Okay, fine. That's tough. My accountant goes nuts if uh, I don't tell him. So you tell me what I usually write is um, enjoy the journey. Oh, good. That's good. Because it really is. It's just, it's one's going to Arizona. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will yes, do my typical. Yeah. Uh, this evening, it's rather unique in the sense that our speaker, the subject that's being talked about is rather unique, but also we have two people involved in it. Normally we have one. But uh, looks like they have done a lot of work in the past to a study in the subject, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to both Leslie and Richard, right? Yep. And you pronounce your last name? Strauss. Strauss. Richard Strauss. Very good. He'll compose for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I'm not sure. I need the microphone. I'm just going to flip it around. Sorry for the noise, but... I can't see what I'm doing from the podium, so is that a little better? Does that help a little better? Okay. I'm going to go this way. Thank you. I can't see what I'm doing. What happens if we turn on some of these lights? If we turn on a purple light, man. Is that better? Sure. Just like that? Is the screen good that way? Yeah, it's fine. First of all, thank you very much for having us, Gloria. Thank you for inviting us up here. Um, and this is our first time really visiting in fields. Actually, it's very dark and it's hard to tell, but I'm sure it's lovely. Is it lovely up here? Really, we're starting to tell. Um, as the title page shows you, uh, the name of the book is Alhouse of Connecticut. Um, by Richard and I, and our daughter Jessica did a uh, lion's share of the photography. Um, a lot of it while she was terminally pregnant, and then, then I lost her to motherhood and all the other stuff. Um, a little background, Richard and I have been in Chester, Connecticut, which is the lower Connecticut River Valley. Feel free to come visit if you're Group 9, down here in the state. Um, very lush, flush part of the state. We found it accidentally about 35 years ago and um, hope to stay there for forever um, because we love it. Um, and basically it was um, our daughter who got us started on, the, on all of this. One Memorial Day as we were walking into town and if I'm lucky I'll hit the button in the right direction and if not There we go. Yeah. There it is. That's the first, thank you. That's the first outhouse that, that got this book inspired. And it was inspired by Jess um, walking into town for Memorial Day for our town parade when she said, you know, somebody ought to photograph these things. And she was absolutely right. And we thought maybe we could do a history of the town through the backyard presentation because Chester is loaded with outhouses. Um, another phenomenon which we discovered was due to the fact that we are pretty rural and the rural towns held on to these things. But there wasn't enough to write a book. I, I put a little sign up in my office window, I have a real estate office in, in the center of town, and got two or three responses. Not a book. Lost track of it, got followed other things, and got a call from one of the 
reporters from the Hartford Current who was visiting town, Elaine Griffin. She's been writing about the, uh, uh, the Kamajewski trial, of course, saying she got stuck on that. But we had lunch, and she said, what are you doing? And then she brought her photographer, and they came and photographed our house, saying, these people are going to write a book. And the next thing you know, the phone started to ring. We got emails. We got phone calls. She got tons of emails of people saying, where do I find a book? It didn't exist yet. But what we had started did, that she launched the journey through all eight counties in Connecticut. Um, we contacted as many historical societies and librarians and assessors as we could find to try to find out where these things were. And we got very lucky. Um, the little book, which is appropriate for a little building, um, is filled with stories from all over Connecticut. It's not just us, and you'll see this as we go on. Whoops, did I go too fast? Oh, uh, you know, I just can't get this right. Bear with me. Okay. That's our outhouse. And it was something we actually never really noticed or paid any attention to when we bought our farmhouse, which is now happily 100 years old. 1910, very ordinary kind of New England farmhouse, little one-car garage, and this stupid little outhouse in the back. But when the garage had to come down, it was really standing by memory alone, uh, the outhouse should have come down as well. And this is when I was happy Richard went to work because while the builders were there excavating, I had them pick the thing up and move it up on our hill. I then had them shore it up, re-roof it, I had painters paint it. I don't even want to tell them exactly what we've invested in this thing, but it has a lot of memories for the Strauss family because we used it in, as a multifunction over, over many years, and it started, I would say, our first love of it. Not doing it. There we go. Come on. Wrong way. I, it'll take me a bit, but I'll get it. There we go. When our girls were horseback riders, and they decided it was the perfect clubhouse, they painted horses everywhere, including horse tails on the seats. Ours is a three-holer. It's very typical. There's, there's nothing special about it. And we discovered that in spades as we started to move around town and found other ones. When the girls grew up, it became my potting shed. I have all my, if I can't find a pot for repotting, it's in the shed somewhere. It's also been home to several animals who have discovered how much fun it is to be there in the winter time. By the way, I meant to tell you, we welcome your stories. We welcome uh, your questions at any time. It's, it's not a lecture. It's a fun kind of, I hope, presentation. And, and what makes it fun is those of you that have a good story to tell, just throw your hand up and let me know. This, this, uh, this outhouse belongs to the Smith family on Jagger Lane in Chester. We found so many. I'm going to start with Chester and then I'll move you around the state. Again, another potting shed right next to their garden. Um, very carefully taken care of, but again, not an outhouse any longer. This one belongs to my daughter's nursery school teacher, Mrs. Kosky. She has never been in it. <laughs> She's afraid of the spiders, maybe snakes. She doesn't know. Never been in it. And it wasn't necessary to open the door to get to it because if you walked around back, it's a giant gaping hole up into the air. It's you know like um, an embankment outhouse, so to speak. And I did find a catalog in there. I found the catalog in there, and it was not Sears Robot. It was a giant truck catalog. I can't explain that. Somebody used it. As a matter of fact, Pat said it was used into the 1950s. Um, even though they had indoor plumbing, they still used it. Uh, not her. She wouldn't go in it. Wasn't her idea of fun. This is actually, I couldn't get inside, filled with hell of bales of hay and, and 
whatever else attached to, this outhouse is attached to the back of a barn. So you can get in it from outside or you can get, it, get in it from the barn. And the barn animals actually probably kept it nice and toasty in the winter time. So, um, but one of the things, in, in addition to the little buildings we got uh, more and more fascinated by, little windows and little ornaments and you'll see. And they're really, they're just not making them like this anymore. <clears throat> they're making them. As a matter of fact, uh, we have some display information in the back from a gentleman from Colchester. Um, and he's building them. He, he's going around. People are, whether they're using these outhouses or not, I don't know. But he's trying to build authentic type outhouses. This one, this one actually dates back, I think, originally to the 1850s, which is pretty far back, considering most of them the sills were rotted away, and that's one of the reasons they were lost. But in Chester, Edward C. Hungerford was our representative to the state and one of the founding fathers of Chester Bank. He had come from Hadline, bought some land in Chester. His house is still there. He's not in it. His house is still there, beautiful little gingerbread. And the outhouse now holds their pool equipment. Um, they have a little swimming pool on the other side. But I like to think of that as one of our more prestigious outhouses since, um, since he was an elected official. I thought that was pretty impressive. And the louver, there's a louver on the side. Truly not an original feature. If you are in Chester, one of the focal points in the village is Jennings Pond. You get some Courier and Ives moments out there where the skaters, if you have good ice, which is hard to find in Connecticut between the snow and the wind blowing and everything else. But the kids play hockey and people pull their little babies around on sleds. And this outhouse has the best view of the pond, better than the house. From the main house, you have to sort of sneak a peek through a side window, maybe the attic. But this is right on, on the pond. It has uh, three seats, one of which is a child-sized seat with a beveled edge and a step up to it. Um, again, not currently used for absolutely anything. It just stays there, painted in the same color scheme as the main house and the garage. But I think my favorite Chester outhouse belongs to this Victorian farmhouse. And if you look, I'm standing actually next to their barn slash garage. But from whatever angle you look at, that little outhouse just makes the yard. Don't you think it's adorable? <laughs> I, if you're not a fan, maybe you think I'm nuts. But I really feel that it's, it's like putting on your top hat. You know, you, you've got your house, your garage, your barn, and your outhouse. I asked a lot of these folks if they had good stories. Now, in this particular home, um, the woman who lives there now grew up there. She was born and raised there, and I thought she, Peggy would have great stories, but in fact, the best story she tells me is across the street at the United Church, there was an outhouse, and her brother Leonard and his buddies always got in trouble Halloween, because they'd go out and tip the outhouse into Jenny's Pond, which, as, again, where we're all skating and having a nice time. But moving back to the first outhouse on Spring Street, which belongs to our dentist, um, he also purchased another little house that he calls the Recycle House. He, it, it was a <coughs> diary to renovation, and he has basically gone dumpster picking, and people send him stuff. Every, everything he's used to rebuild the Recycle House is recycled materials from something that had to be torn down. So his outhouse at the bottom of his driveway is uh, has sand and shovels and salt, whatever he needs to get up that driveway. And um, he was very proud. That one got into the newspaper also, so it's a celebrity outhouse. Then Jess and I went up to East Haddam. 
And all around Senator Christopher Dodd's house are outhouses, not his. But the whole, all of Main Street, we found four, actually got three of them into the book. Um, this one, uh, what I found absolutely remarkable was the landscaping. If you look way on the top photograph, like, uh, on, the, on the way right, you see a little bit of stonework. That's, that's an in-ground pool with absolutely beautiful stonework and wrought iron railing, and yet the outhouse had better landscaping. And every time they have work done on the main house, they make sure the outhouse is carefully taken care of. That little toilet paper roll, I thought, was also, I believe, it's a relatively, um, probably a period, probably an original. One thing I should tell you, we, we didn't get into this, as you can tell, because we're outhouse experts or historians. We got into this because we thought these things were adorable and we tried to figure out what people are doing with them and why they're bothering to pay taxes on them because most of you are paying taxes on these outbuildings. Um, so we learned a lot and we probably have a lot of answers, but we don't, we don't know it all. So if you've got something you want to share, please just jump right in. Now the Connecticut River runs all around the town of East Haddam. And if you look through the window on the right, you are looking at the Connecticut River. Once again, you cannot see the river from their main house. But if you were sitting in the outhouse, you could spend the whole day there enjoying boats up and down the river and whatever else. I, I'm absolutely, I, I think that was the most surprising to me was to see how many people position these little buildings far enough away from the house that they weren't annoyed by them, but close enough that they could get to them regardless of the weather. But look at the views. Now, if you go back to the left bank of the Connecticut River up to Haddam, there's a, a subsection of Haddam called Higginum. And this is an old schoolhouse that was relocated to this location. It's not the original location of the schoolhouse, nor is it the original location of what's left of the outhouse. Um, but current owners made sure everything was still together and, and, and intact. This dates back, the, the schoolhouse dates back to probably 1814 when Haddam established 14 school districts. And the original outhouses, there were two. The boys had a five-holer and the girls had a three-holer. Which I did not understand. Ladies, you've all been online. I mean, who stands online at it? The ladies or the men? Nothing's changed. <laughs> the five, the five holder that the boys used is about a mile away down the road, and I understand that there was pool equipment in it, but I didn't get to see that one. One of the things I mentioned earlier that was so amazing were, uh, was how many people contacted us with their stories, um, with their memoirs with their pictures, with, with whatever. And one of the gentlemen that I have never met that sent us a story is uh, Steve Graverow, who is the curator for the Canaan Historical Society. And he sent, he sent these photographs and his story. And the story is so wonderful, I just, I'm gonna read most of it to you. Steve says he had a unique opportunity to attend a one-room schoolhouse from first through fifth grade. He finished fifth grade in 1952. Of course, the school did not have the modern conveniences of running water or lavatories. We got, this is Steve speaking, we got our water from the hand pump well and we used the outhouses as our lavatories. The girls had a two-holder and the boys had three seats painted battleship gray with whitewashed walls. During the winter, it was a cold trek to the outhouse, which was not a long distance behind the school. But in the snow and cold, it was quite an effort, not something kids enjoyed doing. If the path had not been blazed by the older kids and you were the first to go, it involved getting all your winter gear on, leggings, boots, coats, hats, gloves, only to have to take some of it off again 
at the other end in the freezing cold. I guess it was easier for us boys, but still a lot of work. I recall one day in the fourth grade, my friend Peter had donned all his gear and gone off to the outhouse. Miss Kelly was pointing out some location on the map for a geography lesson when she suddenly dropped everything, rushed out of the schoolroom without any coat or boots. She scurried around back to the outhouse and returned with Peter held by the ear. <clears throat> Her feet were all wet with snow, and she was furious. Apparently, she had looked out the back window and had seen smoke coming from the outhouse. <clears throat> Peter had stolen some cigarettes from his mother and lit one up in the outhouse. The entire school, all 26 of us, then received a lecture on the evils of smoking, and Peter's mother was called. She also received a scolding from Miss Kelly. The school still stands and is now a museum. The outhouses have been reconstructed as the original ones from 1865 had outlived their wooden sills. Peter has since died from lung cancer as the scolding he received did not dissuade him. I will never forget the impression Miss Kelly's lesson on non-smoking left on me. Each time I visit a museum, I think of Peter and his alternative use of the boys' outhouse. <laughs> then we went west to Monroe. You ever been out to Monroe? Absolutely beautiful, God's country. Rural, rural, rural. And there are a ton of outhouses in Monroe and Reading. The town of Monroe <coughs> actually purchased several parcels of land, um, one of which was an old colonial burying ground across from the Monroe School, uh, Center School. And I got a tour of the town from the past historical uh, society president, Ed Coffey, who was a retired teacher and encouraged the town to purchase a circa 1780 one-room schoolhouse and restore it into a modern-day living history museum for the kids. They did this around 1970. It needed an outhouse. And one was donated by the Turner family, relocated behind the school. And when the kids go for lessons, they have to go one day every school year to have their lesson in the one room schoolhouse. They have to use the outhouse. They do not have to maintain it or clean it. It is professionally pumped out, not to worry. But I, I thought that school with the boat ceiling, and it was absolutely beautiful. Every desk had a little pen and quill and ink, inkwell, and just a, a beautiful restoration. I keep mentioning historical societies. I don't know if you guys are into this kind of thing. Do you restore and purchase, and are you custodians of the past? <coughs> All right, Gloria, where we go. You have a one-room school house? Yes. Cool. I'm very proud of you. Also in Monroe, they are stewards of the oldest church in Fairfield County. Next to it, they have, un they have also relocated an outhouse for public use because the oldest church in Fairfield County has no plumbing. So this is where they send everybody. They use it as the meeting house, not the outhouse, the main building. As <laughs> <laughs> As a meeting house, uh, lecture hall, weddings, all kinds of things. It's also um, near the uh, local hiking trails, so they leave this open all the time for, for public use, which is a nice thing to do also. And the third building that Ned took me to was at the Beardsley House. They again acquired an outhouse. This one is, it was a work in progress at the time. It's just sitting on some blocks. Um, not functioning in any way, shape, or form, but it had a nice little star carved in the uh, gable end. I thought that was cute. And the Beardsley House is their museum. They also do a tremendous Halloween scary night there, which I would like to go back for, but I haven't seen it. Willimantic is, again, we're moving now towards the east part of the state, a little more northeast. And the Willimantic Historical Society and their Garden Club get together and they have what are called Victorian Days. 
and they feature the houses and the Victorian gardens. So we found out about this one, which as you can see is an extended building. There's a small barn type shed attached to it. Um, hard to see, but the flowers were so beautiful, I couldn't resist. And this one dates back probably to early, early uh, 19th century English garden and outhouse. We think that the Victorian house dated to 1888, which is later, but the gardens were there before the outhouse and the main house, go figure. So then we kept going north and we went up to Coventry. And this, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, this is the little house, no pun intended, it must have been a family somewhere along the line. I mean, it is a little house, but um, again, the historical society up there has, uh, and the Coventry Historical Society has gone through a tremendous amount of energy to restore this because this is extremely famous. This belonged to um, Aaron Strong. It was part of the Strong House, whose daughter, who, I'm sorry, whose niece is Elizabeth Strong. And she married the guy across the street whose name was Richard Hale in 1746. Starting to get this yet? Okay. And Richard and Elizabeth gave birth to a cute little baby boy named Nathan. And so the Nathan Hale House, which is in Coventry, has its own outhouse, which is nothing to look at. But this one, for some reason, kept being moved across the street from the Hale Homestead back to the Strong Homestead. And so now it is at the Strong Homestead, and it's part of a complex of historic buildings that um, they welcome uh, all kinds of visitors. They have a great museum. But they, the Historical Society did what they felt was a detailed, detailed historic restoration of this one, right down to the shingle group and the cupola. And the, you can see plaster walls and wave next to the child's. You're looking at the child's seat. On the opposite wall is a four holer for the adults. It's very cute the way they did it. Another rural town where you will find many outhouses is Reading. And what I learned, I think, I, I'm trusting that the information is correct. This comes from Charlie Couch uh, of Reading, who is an, an architectural historian. And he felt that a lot of the, one of the reasons that the outhouses lasted so long in Reading was because they fought FDR's rural electrification program. They didn't want electricity. They didn't want any of that modern stuff. They were afraid that everybody would come through and crowd their cute little village and make a mess. So they fought it, and these outhouses stood well into the 1940s, when they finally, a lot of people gave it up and, and, and uh, erected them. But one after the other, more beautiful. There's a, hard to see, not a great photo. I did this one, I didn't have Jessica. Uh, the top left, that's poised by a brook. Uh, and, uh, and it's still an outhouse. I don't think anybody's really using it. It's at the end of a cornfield, but it's got a roll of toilet paper in there in case you need it. So. <laughs> a little closer to home, Glastonbury, there was a wonderful article in um, a historic magazine, a, a Yankee-type magazine, about the uh, Dolce family in Glastonbury who had done an absolutely pristine restoration of their uh, Greek Revival home that was built in 1840. And they found this outhouse in another part of town and again painted it in the exact color scheme of the house. The, it's a five-seater, absolutely beautiful. You could have dinner in there, you really could. <laughs> if you had to. Anybody have any questions or thoughts? No? A five holer, yeah. Well, you know, it was a family thing. You didn't want to have to go out there in the dead of night all by yourself. And if you had a family with a lot of kids, mom did not want to make multiple trips out there. It was, it's time for bed. Everybody hit the outhouse. So, boom, boom, boom. 
This one's in Middletown, and it has an unusual double shingle siding, which is exactly like the one on the main house. It's an old farmhouse, big old barns all over the place. What astounded me about this is there's a rain gutter across the front of it. No downspouts, just a rain gutter. It, like you would have a diverter, but it's not going to be much of a diverter because it's just going to come over the top and in any case. So I thought that was interesting. More interesting than that is in Sandy Hook. This is part of, these are part of a collection. There's a, a really interesting woman there, Dee Dee Bond. She had three when we were putting the book together, and she had every intention of acquiring more. She just gets some friends to put them on a flatbed truck wherever she finds them, not mentioning anything to her husband, mind you, just sort of sticking them up in their back of their farm, and if he notices, he notices. You know, it's like our friend keeps getting more horses. She's got 17 horses, her husband thinks she has six. But the one on the right is a before and after. She was good enough to supply us with the before picture. That's how it arrived from the Botsford Post Office. And at the end, she's got her little rain barrel next to it. It's next to her garden, and she's got all her gardening supplies in it. Top left, she uses for parties when she doesn't want everybody in the house. I mean, she's really got it all thought out. Her intention is to have an outhouse village and maybe an outhouse theme park. You see, you think we're a little kooky, but yeah, uh, uh, truly, we met kookier people than us. This is in Weathersfield, and this was a rescue. And we're going to talk about rescues. You've seen a lot of these were moved from one location to the other. A lot of them were torn down just as a status symbol. When folks finally did get indoor plumbing, they wanted everyone to know. So the first thing they did was rip down the outhouse so that you'd drive by and go, oh, look, the Smiths had plumbing. So a lot of them were lost that way. And of course, they were lost in the cities very early on as uh, people just didn't have land for them. And who wanted to be outside with a million people looking at you? But this one in Weathersfield was rescued from the old Weathersfield, the, uh, the town green on Broad Street, by um, the Harveys. Uh, <laughs> and what he did, what wasn't very nice, is he went golfing with his buddies and gave them a, brought a case of beer with them. And when they couldn't say no, he uh, brought them over to the town green, had his, his ski mobile trailer, and, and this, he promises that this was just barely standing there. He got all the permissions he needed, and they loaded it onto the ski mobile trailer and carted it back to his house. And look, I mean, look at, look at the detail on this. Isn't that beautiful? One side was prettier than the other. And then just to show you how other people aren't as crazy as, or more crazy, than, these two stopped and asked if they could be photographed going into the outhouse. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the beginning of that. Just married in Weathersfield. If you go up to Portland, which is north of Middletown on the east bank of the Connecticut River, you will find uh, Rick Kelsey's family homestead. They, he was born into a homestead where it's been in the family for over 200 years and they have Kelsey Pond at the bottom of it. If you look through all the fall foliage down there, you will see a little speck of pond, and here we go again, best view right from that little outhouse. Um, Rick is the, um, he is the uh, town, what is he, uh, he, he runs their public works, I'm going to blank, senior moment. Rick runs the Public Works, and part of what they do in Portland is they have a pumpkin fest in October, and the biggest pumpkins are there, and they weigh them, they have a big party, and he doesn't want everybody in his house, so he puts the sign up that it's the, I don't know if you can see it, the, <laughs> the Portland, the, the pumpkin pooper. Pumpkin. Yeah, yeah. Yep. yep. The Portland pumpkin pooper. 
and that's what it is. But uh, they, don't, they really don't use it for anything other than during the pumpkin fest. If you go up to Moodis, which is a subsection of East Ham, you'll find Pinky Murphy's girls. Um, every single one of the three holes is used very efficiently, filled with shavings, sometimes eggs, and the girls are free ranging all around there. Um, she, this is also a rescue that uh, Pinky found in another part of, of uh, Haddam, I believe. But these, they're not shy at all. They don't care if they're in there together. Killingworth. Killingworth. Sue Dowling Slover. Uh, again, most of these are really only, you'll find them, people that buy antique homes and, and treasure, you know, which you can't build any longer, are the ones that are either rescuing or thrilled that there's an outhouse. I, I, rarely came across a new home that somebody was dying to have an outhouse. But uh, Sue and her husband found, uh, have a pool on the other side of the hedge, so they use this as their pool cabana. And they got cute little curtains, their little umbrellas all over them, and his and hers on the seats. Um, but this was originally a five-holer. And I spoke with an absolutely wonderful woman Opal Wilkinson, who back in 1930s, her husband, uh, her husband's family owned this home and gave uh, Opal and her husband part of their land so they could move about a quarter mile up the road. And her husband, rather than build a new outhouse, cut this one in half and left the two holder here and took three holes with him. She said, she was 90 when I spoke with her, she said, I to this day never understood what he was thinking. But, in any case, so it's like Solomon's baby now. Another rescue in Deep River came from Westbrook, and this one is the ultimate storage shed. I promise you I had to move a giant uh, uh, reunity umbrella out of the way because uh, it's, you couldn't even move in here. And she decorated, there's a flower box on one side, all kinds of little things she thinks that, uh, and she's a funny lady, Peggy uh, Cypher, just loves this. It's right on the road on West Bridge Street, in case you need to go find it. I got really lucky, found out um, about Mary Grader's photograph. Mary prides herself in being an octogenarian, uh, I, this is what she said, I'm an octogenarian and fourth generation Deep River native. And this is a photograph that was taken by her uncle in 1934 when, when she said, when not too many folks had cameras. And inside are two of her brothers and her cousin from Staten Island. The kids are just sitting there kicking back. And I was able to have this reproduced. It's just a wonderful photograph. The um, it's no longer standing. It was on Essex Street in Deep River. And she said one of the most amazing things, there was a newspaper down in the uh, lower part of the state called The New Era. And she said there was an article in it that reported that the Rankins are putting in a bathroom as newsworthy. Isn't that funny? <laughs> Whoop, did I miss one? Ah, oh, I just held the button too long, I'm sorry. I went right past. Didn't do it right, huh? There we go. Is this amazing? Now, this was done by Mr. Cribbs, who was up in Hartford, and I went to visit him, and he wanted me to take pictures of other artwork, but that's Mr. Cribbs. And, and at the time of the photograph, um, he was 90 years old. Mm -hmm. And he loved carving miniatures. He had all kinds of miniature dollhouse furniture, would sell nothing. He gave it to family or whatever, but he carefully unwrapped chairs, I mean, a Windsor chair, down to every tiny spindle detail. It was just amazing. This is a one-gallon jug with a three-quarter inch uh, neck. 
And he made up some contraption with a wire hanger and some Loctite glue and put piece by piece in there. If you saw it, you would be amazed. There's a little crow on the top and a little doggy at the door. And he just had the most fun. Um, he has a, a woman's room, you know, he calls it the woman's room. I, I just it, it had the most fun with him. And he takes, he took more pride in his outhouse in a bottle than in the fact that his name is on the moon as one of the engineers from Hamilton Standard who designed all the spacesuits and whatnot. They were, there's a plaque and a, and a scroll on the moon with his name on it, but he said this was a bigger, bigger moment for him. And about, um, as soon as the book came out, we, I, I sent him a couple of copies with a thank you note for uh, contributing, and about three weeks later, his daughter-in-law wrote that he, that, was, that was his biggest claim to fame. He was thrilled, and he had just passed away. So one of the things, I, it's, I don't mean to be morbid, but you know when you have something that's no longer, it's like books, you know, and I'm going to have books around much longer. It's, it, the stories here came from folks who had wonderful memories that our kids will never know. And, and that's, uh, that's kind of sad. So we, we truly enjoyed meeting people and sharing their stories with you in the book. More stories came from a gentleman uh, in Durham, Henry Coe, who is the treasurer and was vice president of the Durham Fair Association. And if you've ever been there, they process about, on a good weekend, 300,000 people for fair weekend. So, of course, he had outhouse stories and lines of people and stories about what the facilities were way back when. And he was a great contributor, but one of the things that Henry was most proud of was they had an art contest and they had a jury panel, they, had, they took one of the original uh, bathrooms, divided it into five panels and had five artists uh, do their artwork on the side of the building. Then they had a little teeny outhouse on a table for the people's choice to vote. Everybody put their little ballots into the outhouse. And um, the winner is one of these. Now, I know it's hard for some of you to see because it's so far away. It's easier to see that all of this is in the book. And a lot of people think that it's the one in the middle because it, 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 it had a trunk line effect to it where if you were walking to it, the path in the outhouse there actually went right down to the path that you were walking on. But that's not the winner. The winner is actually in the bottom left corner by a little seven-year-old girl. Well, she didn't paint it, she designed it. Little Lily King. <clears throat> and if you look closely at all the animals, they all have their legs crossed and their hands down and they are suffering something fierce. So, there you go. And we had a great story too, but I'll let you read it in the book so I don't hold you up. The Essex Historical Society found an outhouse on the property that they purchased as their museum property over um, this Pratt House on West Ave. And they asked us to come over and, you know, what do we think about the outhouse? Well, it's definitely not in, the, in its original location. Somebody moved it closer to the building. And what fascinated me with this was that blue stuff up top is actually what's left of the wallpaper. Somebody went to a lot of trouble to preserve it. The sides and the, and the, uh, on, and the gables on the, the roof of this thing are all anywhere from 10 to 12 inch planks. It's absolutely magnificent. And there's no way to, to do a, a real restoration on this, but I, I encourage them pr to preserve it as best they could, especially the wallpaper. That's a hoot, I thought. So as I mentioned earlier, we got more and more interested, not just in the little buildings, but in the little features of the building, like the windows. Some, some opened up sideways, they cranked sideways, they were circles, they were, uh, uh, had mullions, they had, you know, true divided lights. 
and, and one was more beautiful than the other. Not only were the windows fascinating, but some of the ornaments, none of these are original ornaments. Ornamentation was not something we ever saw. Yes, they had cutouts, uh, they either had crescent moons or stars or uh, suns on them to represent whether it was a men's outhouse or a lady's outhouse, we'll see if you know the difference. Um, but those were functional. It let daylight in, it let moonlight in, or they actually allowed for some ventilation, which was <clears throat> relatively important. And in addition to the ornaments, the hardware. I was talking with somebody earlier about an outhouse that she was loath to use because it had a lock on the outside. And of course, if you had a troublesome little brother, that was always a big concern. But the lock on the outside kept some of this, kept these a little bit cleaner when if mom was in control and didn't want mischief makers hanging around. So it was important. But the hardware, uh, just an amazing assortment of ideas from glass knobs to wrought iron to whatever. And of course, the assortment of seats. We saw anywhere from a little one holer to the largest one we found was the five holer in, in uh, Glastonbury. But uh, I, I've talked with people who used to know bench, like just rows on both sides of a big room, 12 across on each side, that they had to use when they were in the service, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I was talking with a gentleman who said he had one that they didn't have to flush it or clean it because the stream ran under it. Ew. And we're going to end this with the one in Chester, where remember that you know you're never truly dressed or fully dressed. This is the back of it, and, and in case you're wondering, one of the clean-out techniques obviously was to have a trap door in the back. Usually it latched upward, and you could either pull out uh, buckets if you had them, or if you had a long drop situation, you could throw some lime down in there and hope that it would uh, deteriorate everything a little more quickly. So that is the end. Um, one of the things we've done as at the very end, as a result of so, so many rescues, is we had people that were interested in rescuing and wondered if we'd found any that people wanted to get rid of. So we formed the CRAP hotline, which stands for Come Rescue a Privy. And actually, uh, we have about nine or ten people still on the list. We only really were able to facilitate one good rescue. And that went to the original, our dentist on Spring Street, he put it at his new house that he's his recycle house, so it's kind of fun uh, to have them. Um, Spring Street alone had that we found three outhouses in Chester. We really thought we were going to find hundreds of these things, but as you can see, there are tons of reasons why they've come down, um, either from deterioration or just not being needed any longer, or not wanting to pay your taxes or whatever. Um, but we had a great journey throughout the state, and if any of you had have contributed to the book, and we haven't acknowledged you. Thank you very much. Couldn't have done it without all of you. Any uh, questions? We have a question. Uh, this is just a side note to, uh, excuse me, these privies that were closed over today are a real <clears throat> treasure trove for any file collectors, because obviously when they didn't use them anymore. They just threw all the household items into that. And it's especially in behind tenements in the cities like in New York, if they can be located with permission from the owner, these bottle diggers who dig dumps also will dig very deep in these privies and they'll come up with fantastic bottles. Some very yeah. valuable medicine, booze, um, commemorative flasks, poisons, household stuff. And it, it's a very popular, you know, it, it is. What uh, was it? Nick Belladonna. Nick Belladonna. 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 It, yeah. Who is who is the uh, uh, with the state and and is an architect uh, or a hist uh, architectural historian is one of the first to to corroborate what you're saying. People they, they love to find 
old outhouse locations and dig. The big dig in Massachusetts, when they were digging to put the tunnel in, they had, they were, had to uh, dig up a parking lot and they found like this sump hole in there, literally, and found the remains of an outhouse and all kinds of very elegant fabrics, pieces of fabrics, uh, brocades and velvets and whatnot, um, and did a, it did a historic study on the site and it discovered that there had been a very, very unhappy, wronged wife whose husband did her wrong, did her bad, and found historically that he had written to her and said, I understand you won't send me any of my stuff, but please at least send me my boots. And they found all of his clothing, or lots of it, shredded, her, her sewing kit, everything was down in that hole. Um, apparently, he was a bad boy. Yes. Did you find enough material to uh, craft so long for another book? Another book? You mean number two? <laughs> we probably did find enough material, but we decided not to do that. Um, I think most of the ones that were really beautiful to photograph are in the book. This is just a, a slight sampling of what's there. Um, we found actually more than existing outhouses, we found the stories that I wish we had been able to include and share. And um, we've tried to credit everyone. I mean, we didn't make stuff up. If, if it came from you, you're in the book. So, um, I mean, there's <laughs> one of my favorites is a gentleman. Where is he from? Is he from Suffield? I think from Suffield who um, says that he always liked to go to his neighbors. They would sneak across and use the neighbor's outhouse because they had a lingerie catalog in that one. <laughs> How were they heated? They weren't. They weren't heated. Last thing you want to do is light a fire inside one of those puppies. <laughs> yes, they exploded very often if you went in there with a lantern of some sort, so that's why you hoped that there was uh, a nice ventilating crescent moon or something. Yes? I think um, they were a lot less modest. I mean, today if you ask somebody younger to go up to the bathroom with each of the adults and they had two or three of you sitting on them, I don't think that would well. Right, I don't think the privacy was, was the same back then. Um, our friend, our friend Jonathan, uh, has a wonderful story about when he was growing up. Now he's he's my age, but his grandparents had a place in on the Durham Killingworth line, and they had no electricity there, no plumbing, no nothing. And he loved to um, to spend summers with them. And when his uncle came up, he went out to the outhouse with his uncle, and the two of them were sitting there. And Jonathan said. He felt so grown up, sharing stories with his uncle, being out in the outhouse. See, it was it, it was a social thing. I think more than more than the, the privacy factor, especially for little kids with a fan, in a family. Yes, sir. There was a house, a one-room schoolhouse, where the uh, outhouse down in the back is farming. Do you ever find that one? No. I'll have to find it and just take pictures for my own self. We acquired a whole lot of wonderful photographs and stories and books. Uh, where's Bob? Bob gave us a book. There he is. It's on the table. And, I mean, everybody's just sort of contributed to this collection. We were in, um, where were we on that rainy day? In Vernon? Yeah. Were we in Vernon? And there was this sweet woman sitting in the front row with a shoebox on her lap. And at the end of the presentation, she said, excuse me, could I speak with you for a moment? And I said, yeah, certainly. She goes, I come from Berlin. I, she traveled, pouring, pouring rain on a Sunday afternoon, traveled from Berlin over to Vernon with her shoebox collection. She had a lifetime collection of outhouse memorabilia, toilet paper samplings, which she labeled carefully from all over Europe. Uh, and she's and ashes that she had in a little bottle 
from her outhouse after it came down in 1930 hurricane. They had to burn it and she saved the ashes. Oh, okay, it's a little eccentric, but she said, you know, would you like these things? Now, as you asked, are we going to write a sequel? Um, we have no intention of doing that. So I said, well, thank you, but, but no, I not And she went back and sat down and looked very dejected. And I thought, OK, Leslie, you really blew that moment. I said, she, so I went back over. She said, I'm 86 years old, and nobody wants these in my family. I said, well, you know what? We'd be honored to have your memorabilia in our collection. And she was so thrilled. So her stuff's on the table, and little outhouses, toilet papers, everything. I hope you have a look. Yes? Leslie, I'm not sure whether, have you been informed that we have a one-room schoolhouse? And we had an Eagle Scout do some research, and he has recon not reconstructed, he had made a one holder for the uh, rear. Super. Super, take pictures before somebody lets it go. Yeah. We are stewards, and people who have these little buildings and antique homes and one-room schoolhouses, I think we have a responsibility to take care of these things and preserve our past. How many people have actually used one? Oh, my girls, are, our well went dry. When our well went dry, man, there was just no going in the house. And a nice fresh roll of whatever was, this is before cotton milk came out, and said, ladies, and that's when I discovered how many different types of line there is, because I had no idea how to maintain this thing. We used it, um, talked to people who, a lot of people who actually used them, um, and various ways of, it, whether they had the porta early porta potties with the handles on the sides, so when things got filled up, they dig a new couple of holes, pick it up, move it. Mm -hmm. Yes? I was way up in the Maine woods uh, one year, and uh, in this little village that used to be a lumbering community. It's a vacation area now. But anyway, this minister came to the little church there, and he was supposed to be there for a week. But he brought his family, his wife, and three young, very young children. And he couldn't get them used to using the outhouse. They had to go home. <laughs> After three weeks, they probably had a really good home. Yeah. <laughs> well, they were only going to be there a week, but they didn't even last that oh, That's a shame. They should, should adapt, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I should think, especially if you set them out there alone at night. Yeah. Yes? Well, your grandfather had an outhouse at his cottage in Ellington. <laughs> but he worked for the carpet mill in Enfield and carpeted everything, including the outhouse. Oh my he God. He carpeted the outhouse, he had regular toilet seats over the hole, uh -huh. and he had electric lights. <laughs> well, all right. Do you have pictures of this? I have pictures of the outside. Mm -hmm. the inside. No, no, you got you to get those pictures. Nobody's going to believe you. And then in the winter, he would clean it out by tipping it over. Okay, now that's a technique we haven't come across before. Yeah, no people, huh? They had, oh, they had, the, he waited until it was um, dead of winter, tipped it over and pulled the frozen block of whatever out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll, if we write a sequel, I'll make sure to find you and get that in there. <laughs> You spoke of uh, the large ones, and uh, I served my military time in the Far East, and uh, in Korea, I remember using a ten holder. Uh, that was off the line, though. Once you get closer to the line, you did whatever you had to do, no matter what you had. Right, you didn't need a building. Now, when you were in a ten holder, I doubt that you were alone much. Uh, that particular day, when we sat over, I was alone. Oh, oh, you had one day with a ten more? But one particular day. Oh. I, I don't I have any recollection of more than one day. <laughs> 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 
you block that well, part of it out. Oops. I could mention too that uh, we're all adults here. I was in Japan for a while, and uh, Japanese customs at that time, uh, they can go out into the bushes somewhere and do their thing. I remember a woman walking into some bushes around the building and just squatting down there and relieving herself. And, uh, yes, that happened. Okay, fine. Fine. Yes, we're all adults. Yes. If you're down to the Caribbean Islands and take any of the tours, you will be still using outhouses. And the ones that have the street floor in them are probably the ones that bother most people because you have to go over the bridge over the street to get to it. But during the 1940s, 1950s, all the Girl Scout camps and Boy Scout camps all up through New Hampshire and Maine and Vermont, and probably a good deal later than that. We were always using our houses and we yeah. had water. Yeah, but and the ones that went, that were directly over the streams, you know, those streams were flowing down, hopefully, and you, you didn't even want to know where everything was going. But no, lawn drops, we always used the lawn drops when we were camping, sure. Oh, yeah. It was a long drop, wasn't it? <laughs> you waited to hear it? Not me, I was out of there as fast as possible. Uh huh. Well, it, one of the stories is, is from uh, the tobacco country up here. Somebody was telling us about her mom, her mom's stories, where she and a friend had gone into the outhouse, and it was at night, and and the friend said, "Oh, look, you know, there's a kitty." Uh -huh. And then, of course, it took them a while to get cleaned up after that. But yeah. Yes. You know, were they good for gardens? Yeah, they're very good for gardens. And people, you know, very often you'll find the most beautiful flowers. And I'm thinking about your honeysuckle and whatnot, lilacs that grow huge around them. But you know, the old Victorian women there, they certainly didn't want to discuss anything. When they would go out to use the outhouse, the euphemism was that they were going out to the garden. Mm -hmm. Impolite to say. Anyway. I want to thank you very much. Th Gloria, thank you very much for inviting us to be here. And Richard's got books back there, and there's plenty of wonderful stuff for you to look at and enjoy. And then you have food, I think, right? Yeah. Food. Thank you.